big red button. Episode 54, Sitting Car Bonner here with Mark Prescott. Uh, Mark, you're drumming in anthems, dude. Thanks for coming through. Yeah, happy to do it. I was Um, looking forward to it. Absolutely, dude. So before we get into stuff, I wanted to let people know that uh, what I just said the song name, Better Parts. I almost almost said Better Help, which is a therapy app I use. (laughs) So I was like, that's not what we're plugging here. Um, Although if you want to sponsor the show, Better Help. There we go. Giving everyone money, apparently, these days. Beautiful. um, Two two for one. (laughs) Two for one, yeah. Uh, So Better Parts is out now. The music video is out streaming everywhere. Yep. Uh, And then I know we got a show coming up February 3rd uh, in Milford. Yes. Uh, so if anyone wants to go see Anthems, February 3rd, Milford, go make it happen. I think it's a house show. So That's DM right. Yep. For addresses. So yeah, hit us up. We'll let you know where it is, where you, to be. Do you know whose house it is? Like, is it a house you've played I before? Actually, or is no. It, is so, it totally new for you? I'm guessing it's connected to one of the Scooped Up guys. Because okay. it's their, it's like their release show part two. Gotcha. But I'm not actually sure where it is or whose house it is. So it's going to be sick. a surprise for us. That's there. cool. Okay. Yeah. So you have no sense if it's, yeah, a basement, if it's a palace, like what the hell no you get into. No clue. Yeah. Yep. That's exciting. I yep. appreciate you guys. Come, just... come find out with us because, you know, we'll, we'll be <laughs> learning as we go. That's right. I love you guys just signing up for that. Yeah. It's a very like DIY. Mm-hmm. You guys are in this like, like pop punk niche. And I don't know if pop punk's the perfect genre mm-hmm. for you. Uh, but there's like a, a real DIY aspect to that, like oh, whole genre that I love. And I think, yeah, there's so many genres I often talk about how like I think rap takes itself like they do it well. They do the DIY thing of let's go shoot 10 videos today and just yeah. like we'll have 10 music videos. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. In our world, it's like let's wait six months. Let's plan the perfect video. And mm-hmm. like there's pros and cons to each. But I think, yeah, somehow the pop punk world seems to do a great job of like blending these two of like, let's just have a house show. Fuck yeah. it. It doesn't yep. need to be perfect. We mm-hmm. just need to have people here. We need a chance to play music and we'll go from there and i feel like those are oftentimes like the more fun because i yeah. feel like people aren't necessarily concerned about like oh what am i allowed to do you know how can i yep. exist in this space that yeah. has like a, a bouncer at the door and you know all these people watching it's like at a house show it's like yeah we're just having a party we're having fun yes let's hear some dope music yes yeah um perfect for my uh quick plug here is i'm adding music videos for the next year so if you're interested i'd love to add you to the new year let's make something happen um Leave a like, leave a comment, all that stupid stuff that people like to ask for. It does help. The show is small enough that, yeah, a single person clicking like does make it to my ears. Yep. <laughs> so it is nice to know about. Um, better parts, dude. I want yes. to know everything about the video. I need to start with Baggins, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, need okay. to know. All right. Hell yeah. So in the music video, there is a, yeah, for context for people who haven't heard this, and I guess if you, uh, yeah, pause this right now. Go watch the music video. That's way more important. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. Yes. Uh, <laughs> referencing it a lot. So yes. you may have no idea what the heck we're talking about. Yes. Please go look. If you're listening on Spotify, yeah. make a mental note to come back to it later. Yeah. But on YouTube, yes. go check it out. <laughs> um, yeah, so I believe the character's name is Baggins. It's a, that's right, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, so I guess promoting that, I assume it's Dante wearing the wearing the bag around. So uh, I, I'm hesitant to tell you, but I'll get sure. to that in a second. Okay, okay. So yes, my question is, yeah, where does he come from? Where does the character come from? I loved him as like a, yeah, we were just talking about like the, the serious nature of stuff. And I think yeah. one thing that video did really well, and one thing, the I think the float video is the one with the orange color as well. Post. Post. Flow was oh, the first one. Yep. First but, one. Yep. Uh, so I think Post also did well of like, they're just fun. Like there's just like a, I think when I'm working on videos, there's always this sense of like, what's going to grow? What's going to change of like, I don't want just a band performing. There has to be yeah. something that's introducing new ideas as the video goes on. Mm-hmm. And in that it's like, we like to do the breakup story. We like to do all these like dramatic things where it's like, I'm never going to tell a better love story than Romeo and Juliet. Yep. Like there's been so many love stories told that it's really hard to like, modernize it and then make it quick and make it work in three minutes and make it like producible within our budgets within like what we can do as a as a group uh what i think you did well with both of those videos and yeah better helps or better help better (laughs) part specifically i was gonna it's so embarrassing to fuck up but whatever (laughs) um the better part video specifically it's like there's just a positive energy through it and you watch baggins kind of grow and change and he goes Mm. through these adventures and there's like the almost like a home alone style sequence of like him just fucking around and get into a muck around the house but you feel you empathize with him and you watch him grow and to me it was a really like cool way to like introduce like a narrative thing but like it's still fun. It's still casual. It's still lighthearted. It's something that everyone can like digest and take their own two cents from. So yeah, yeah as the, I assume you directed, or I know you directed the video. Mm-hmm. I assume you helped also write it and helped in the, all the behind the scenes process. Yeah. Where does Baggins come from? Where does this idea start? Yeah. So, um, it's, it's funny because he was not a part of the original idea. So I kind of have to take you back a little bit sure. because this, the idea like evolved over time does, and yeah. for different reasons. So <clears throat> the, um, the first thing that like triggered this video was mm-hmm. the discussion about, you know, what is the song about? What are the themes and stuff like that? And mm-hmm. of the many things that Dante had was kind of talking about, the thing that stuck out to me at the time was the idea of taking risks. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of like the first idea that that put us down this path. And at the same time, Sean was talking to a friend of the band and 
kind of discussing the idea of how would the playing shots part of it look. And mm -hmm. to kind of allude to the title, Better Parts, the idea kind of came from like, okay, well, hey, we are three parts of a whole anthems. What if we, you know, kind of lean into that a little bit? The playing shots can be us individually in different mm -hmm. parts of a house or wherever. Um, so better parts. So that was kind of where we started was, okay, we're going to be playing individually and we're going to have some kind of notion of risk taking, mm -hmm. uh, needless risks. And I empathize with you in that moment of like, if a band comes to me and says, we want to do a video at taking risks, it's like, what does that mean? How do I conceptualize that? Like, I, I know what you're saying, but mm -hmm. how do I translate that into a screen and yeah, do it without dialogue, do it without 10 minutes of fluff. How do I get this down into three minutes that is accessible to an audience? So I, yeah, empathize with you in that moment of like, yeah, taking risks sounds like a great theme, but mm -hmm. then what? Then how do we make this, yeah, Well, and so, and so that's actually kind of where Baggins started to show up because at the same time we were kind of discussing like, all right, it's probably time to have a music video that doesn't just feature us. We wanted to have an actor, whether it's someone that we cast or someone we mm -hmm. know. Um, you know, we're like, it's time for us to not be the main actors of whatever storyline is happening in this music video. Mm -hmm. And the first problem we encountered was, okay, well, whoever we go with has to be okay with taking risks. You know, the first, I the first risk idea that we had was uh, climbing up on the roof and getting a shot of up on the roof. So it's like, okay, well, you can fake that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but we're essentially asking someone, hey, are you okay with climbing up on the roof? And not only that, but the character Baggins, this is supposed to be routine for him. Yeah. Like, like this isn't like the first day that he woke up and decided to start taking risks. Yep. He has to be comfortable do yeah. like climbing up and, and doing all these yeah. things. Like any kind of hesitation would have kind of gone against the character mm -hmm. that we were trying to portray. So it's immediately like, okay, well, we got to find someone and they have to be okay with this. As we were kind of trying to come up with how we would do that. And at the same time, we were trying to come up with our list of, okay, what are the risks that we're mm -hmm. showing? Um, <clears throat> I think we started toying with the idea of hiding the person's identity. We didn't know what that looked like yet. We hadn't arrived at the, the mm -hmm. bag yet. Yeah. <clears throat> and the idea behind that was if we had to get someone else in front of the camera for, for the Baggins parts, but we could swap out and we could play Baggins for anything that the actor, mm -hmm. whomever, wasn't comfortable doing. So that was kind of like our backup plan. And it was actually Dante who was like, oh, well, what if we did a paper bag? And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, that's so much better. Because yeah. I was like, I would be like walking through Party City and I saw like masks and stuff. And I was like, not like Halloween masks, but like just, you know, mm -hmm. very plain masks. I was like, oh, like, you know, that could work. Yeah. But nothing was really kind of like, oh, that's it until he said that. And I was like, oh, that yep. could kind of, I like immediately was able to picture that and I was like that could work really well I the the roof <coughs> detail there is so funny because one of my little notes here that we'll get to uh, yeah I'll get to that in a bit but the I saw that in the video and I assumed that it was like we've had this great day and then someone was like what if I just climbed up on the roof and you were like that could be cool and it's funny that that's like not the afterthought of like we're in the spur of the moment good idea like that was the foundational building the very block first. that this was yep. built around absolutely the first one is also like to me the hardest for the like, like the scouting of location like the hardest one to plan around where everything else could have been done in a lot of different houses and that's the one where it's like you kind of needed where you ended up because yeah. you can't just do that in an apartment or i guess you could get yeah, green screen it but that's a whole other can of worms and like yep. Almost against like the ethos of who I think Baggins is. Like Baggins isn't a green screen kind of guy. He's like right. go out and like he, he just <laughs> he, he full send. Yep, just does it. Uh, and I think the other key there is like in concealing his identity, you allow people to see themselves in him. Hundred percent. Otherwise, if it, yeah, whoever you put in that, everyone's gonna have some good and some bad reaction. Like if you put mm -hmm. me in there, there's gonna be someone watching who goes, "Oh, he's cool," and someone else is like, "Fuck that dude's hair." Like fuck, like and that takes you immediately out of what Baggins is supposed to be <laughs> about. Because yeah, now we're thinking about. Yeah, me instead mm -hmm. of who Baggins is, instead of just the action that he's going through. Like it, by depersonalizing it, you allow people to see themselves and kind of write whatever story they want. That's uh, absolutely correct. Yeah, and I like the the paper bag is an extension of that. If you're mm -hmm. right, any mask that you do is a part of the identity. It becomes part of the identity. And mm -hmm. Of course, sleep token maybe is the perfect example here of the culturally relevant example mm -hmm. of like, yeah, we don't see their faces, but through their masks, we we're told that they're gory, that they're dark, that it's a deep dramatic thing mm -hmm. and a paper bag is the complete opposite yeah, to those masks yeah. of it is as flat it is as cheap it is as like accessible to everyone it's the most like yeah i'm just a run-of-the-mill guy kind yeah. of mask and it's a really clever trick to create a run-of-the-mill person without having to 
make a person be run of the mill. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, really well, interesting story and, there. And it's funny. So that's that's actually why I you know because when we were going through this, I was like, they're going to want to assign an identity to mm-hmm. this person. Yep. And that's inevitable. A lot of people will watch and be like, oh, that must be Dante wearing a mask. Mm-hmm. This must be about the lead singer. He's wearing a bag for some reason. And yep. that's fine. You know, people are always going to interpret things their own way. Sure. That's Everyone wants to read between the lines. It's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and I was kind of thinking, I was like, you know, after this comes out, I'm probably going to have to feel that question a lot. Like, who is under the mask? Because I get it. It's it's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of that mystery. Yeah. Um, but that's absolutely right. The idea behind Baggins is that it could be anyone. And I actually... Uh, when I had first written the treatment to kind of present that to Shauna Dante, um, you know, obviously this is not something that would have ever seen the light of day, but I, I used gender neutral pronouns. Mm-hmm. It wasn't even supposed to be, oh, hey, this is a guy or this is a girl. Like this is supposed to be whoever you want it to be. Yep. And it's the identity of the person is not really important. As a character, the identity of Baggins is that head, yep. that, that mask, yep. and whoever's underneath it isn't really as important. And we're kind of just following the story of this character rather than the story of who's underneath. Which is brilliant. Yeah, I'm connecting. I did a music video for Half Hearted, uh, and I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Insatiable was the name of the song. Uh, and there's like a Bonnie and Clyde kind of love story going on. And one of our big challenges there is like, who do we cast as Bonnie and Clyde? Like, who feels like they could walk in and rob your apartment? Where it's like, they're all our friends. They're all people we like. Right. But who do you like? Peg is like, oh, okay, you're going to be a robber today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and thankfully, Jay had some friends who I can't remember if they were involved in acting or just kind of had like the alt look to them. So yep. it was kind of easy to be like, hey, guys, can you like suspend your disbelief for a little bit and let me tell you how to be a criminal? Uh, but yeah, it was a it was a challenge there of like, we can't just bring anyone in. Like, Jay's not a house robber. I love Jay, but like, right. if yeah, Jay walks absolutely. in to rob your apartment, like, <laughs> that's a good robber. Like, you're pretty stoked to see him come in. <laughs> so it was like, yeah, who do we find that is like, feels like they're coming in with malice? And that's, mm. like, you have to create an identity there. And also, like, to their credit, they were willing to do that. But like, if we, like, we can't bring someone else from abandoned because I don't want to jeopardize that image. Like, we kind of needed someone who is uh, anonymous in the context of the music world. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, you guys had such a great work around there of like, hey, don't worry about them. I want to tell the story of the person. And if we assign an identity to them, that it gets in the way of the story and it kind of muddies the water for us. So Absolutely. By, yeah, it solves like two birds at once. Like you don't have to have an actor and it enriches the story. So perfect. Yeah, Win-win. right. It worked out. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, yeah. And then you had mentioned the idea of, of kind of going up on the roof and finding that location. Mm-hmm. So we were lucky in that that was the first idea that we had. Um, because as we were looking for a location, you Mm. know, at that point, um, Float was filmed in Sean and Dante's house. Um, We had done two guitar playthroughs Mm -hmm. that were in their house. And it's like, listen, this is a great (laughs) house. We got to stop filming here. (laughs) So it was uh, a question of, as we were looking around, that was one of the criteria, um, was kind of, can we get on the roof? Because that we knew that was a, a big part of it. We mm-hmm. didn't know it was going to be the ending, like the kind of conclusion yet, yeah. but we knew that it was going to have to happen. Um, you know, and one of the other things that kind of played into the location was the color palette. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you know, throughout the first EP era, I guess we'll say, of Northeast Disease, we were kind of really working with teal and orange. Yeah. And we were actually ready to move away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these... This single, Better Parts, um, you know, certainly not no longer a part of that release cycle. So we were ready to kind of start exploring new options. Mm -hmm. Now, this song and one other song that perhaps we'll talk about Mm -hmm. in a little bit, um, were actually originally designed to be part of a split with another local band. Gotcha. Okay. So um, as we were going through this process and and as we were planning the music video, um, the artwork for this split had been created. And I was definitely of the mindset where it's like, hey, let's see what they create. Um, and, you know, we'll use that and we'll run with it. Because I'm a big fan of incorporating, like having the look and the visual style of the music video being related to the album artwork. Yeah. I like that, you know. The cohesion, cohesion the branding. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you see that with Float. You see that with Post. Yep. Um, so you I was like, oh. did a great job of that. Oh, Even thank like, you. Even like I think in the, in the <laughs> subtitles, it's the cat- like the correct colors. Like I think you're very thorough with the identity there. I mm. think it's really important. And it's a, yeah, great thing for bands. I think the... One 
And one common mistake I think I see in bands is like this constant rebranding where every six months it's a whole new invention. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you guys have done a great job of like staying consistent with it. And even in like the evolution of it, it, it feels like an evolution. It doesn't feel like a, a start from scratch. It doesn't feel like, all right, throw that away. Now this is what Anthems is. It right. feels like that's what they were. And then it grew into this thing. So that, yeah, even as the colors change, even as the palettes change for, for each release, like it, it does feel cohesive and it feels, yeah, there's a growth and a, a brand identity there that starts to develop. Well, that's great to hear that yeah. that's coming through. Because, you know, we can plan and then and, and have yeah. that uh, be the case as much as we want, but it's yeah. obviously how it's perceived to other people. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so the other band was designing the artwork. And as far as I was concerned, I was like, okay, you know, we at Northeast Disease had its time. Mm -hmm. Whatever they come up with, obviously any revisions and stuff like that will go through. But the colors, I was like, that artwork is going to influence this music video in some way. And then I'm sure they probably looked at um, what we had put out in the past couple months or the past year, and they created artwork that heavily featured that teal and orange. And it's like, yeah. oh, okay, all right, I guess we're sticking with this. Because they were probably like, oh, well, hey, they have this really strong identity. Mm -hmm. We'll just go with that. Yeah, and we're yeah. like, well, we're ready to move away if you want to. <laughs> but the funny part is, obviously, now the better part is out, it's not on a split. Mm -hmm. So that idea, you know... <clears throat> Nothing bad happened, but it, it you know we decided that it wasn't well, the right strange. time based yeah. on 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 things that were happening. But uh, that album artwork still very heavily influenced the color palette for this video. And when we were filming, we were still uh, planning on using that previous album artwork. So that's why the teal and the orange is still very present. Interesting. And it's funny. So um, one shot in particular from the music video, if you remember, when Baggins sits down and he has the two candles. And they're yes. kind of very intentionally placed. You know, there's the two side by side. One's up on a book. The book is red. There's like a, a little bit of matches like laying down. Mm -hmm. That is a direct homage to the original artwork for this split that will never see the light of day now. Is the, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, is that book specific? Because I like, I saw it and I like Googled the title. And it, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, but it was like an old, I think it was like an old Indian like proverb book or some like, some uh, historical classic <laughs> that I was completely unaware of, but it was like, it feels like it must mean something if it was included. Yeah. So is I, the book significant? I praise you for your attention to detail. It's not. Okay. <laughs> the color of the book yeah. is the specifically the orange and then the black ending. Mm -hmm. We actually lucked out. That was just the book that the house that we were filming in had. That's like, how or it is, the, yeah. yeah. So so we grabbed that one because it fit the thing. And I was like, do I need to worry about? <laughs> what this book is and like is anyone gonna look into it and i was like no it'll be fine so so thank you for uh for well, being the one the, the reason i bring that up is because i've got a whole uh i guess you can't see on camera but over there i've got like a uh, shelf of shit that just yeah. all from old music videos and on there is like stacks of books that i'm never gonna read but it's just goodwill and it's me sitting in goodwill going like this book's too big this one's too small this one's too bright the font's too big so i've got a collection of like 30 books that I like mm. for videos. Um, but now I have the thing of like, fuck, that's the same 30. Anytime mm -hmm. you see a book in a video, it's probably one of those books. Now I'm going to go and look. I've gone through yeah, a lot of work everything. to like pick out books that like feel like they work for what I want. And mm -hmm. I've got, yeah, different options there. So of course, when I saw your book, it like triggered the one part of it's my like, brain oh, I have of to like, look up what that is. Yeah. I've spent so much time on books that like, yeah, nothing, I tend to believe nothing's an accident in a video. Mm -hmm. Like when, it, like in that sense, like it wasn't an accident. Like you knew the color and like it's a coincidence for the title, I guess, but like, yeah, everything's intentional, and in that frame, like you're right, it is such a. Uh, I don't want to say minimal, but it's a. It's, there's not a lot of clutter. Like it's a very clean frame, and like the matches you point out is mm -hmm. like a. Yeah, there's a couple of very specific elements, and to me, it was like, okay, these aren't these aren't accidents. So the yeah, where do all these pieces fit in? And yeah, one thing was like, what book is that? <laughs> well, I will say you're not wrong because if you watch the music video, uh, everything looks and was for the most part, except that book. Very intentional. Yeah. Everything was placed in a spot for a certain reason. And mm -hmm. obviously a lot of that alluded to kind of like that symmetry that we had. Yep. I'm sure you you have probably already made this connection, but like we were definitely trying to channel Wes Anderson's style, that symmetry, the the color, like very strict adherence to a color palette. And those were all things kind of leading back into that conversation about location is when we were thinking about it, I knew that I wanted kind of a very secluded area. Mm -hmm. That comes out of after filming post, where we were filming in a state park. That is my favorite story, <laughs> yes. And we, while technically were allowed to be there, <laughs> we were just one very 
you know, unhappy person away. One very reasonable person <laughs> away. Exactly. Like, let's be honest. Like, uh, it's a great thing you got away from it. Yes, technically spreading whatever dust. I don't know what you would call mm -hmm. that. It's not paint. It's like a dry paint. Like powder paint. Powder yeah, paint, type, yes. Yep. Like, technically, it's not illegal. You're not killing anything. But, like, yeah, for sure, a state. Yeah, we, we took the to steps to make sure that this was, like, very environmentally friendly. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, I would never want to negatively impact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. But... For sure, I'm thinking of like my local where I grew up was like the park was right across from the police station, and it's like very reasonably a cop could have come over and been like, mm -hmm. "Hey guys, we can't arrest you for this," but like, don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> kind you, you kind of you're causing a bit of an issue, <laughs> yeah. bit of a scene. It's, you got to yeah, public along. disturbance. Yeah. Well, and plus, once we got to the point where we were filming the smoke grenades, like it's one thing for with the powder paint. Sorry, we're going on a tangent here, but uh, <laughs> we got time for all of them. Please, yes. um, um. You know, because you kind of have to be walking by. And it was in the middle of winter in a park. So <laughs> short for the handful of people that were there walking their dog, there yeah. weren't a lot of people there. And yeah. that was intentional. But, you know, eventually we got to a point where we were filming with the smoke grenades. And suddenly that is a giant beacon mm -hmm. to anyone in the area. Like, hey, that is a large puff. of Now, it's orange smoke. If it was black Thankfully, smoke, yeah. that would be a little yeah. more serious. But still, someone's doing something. That Yeah. What's going on over there? Yeah. I need to go investigate. And then on top of that, you know, guitars you can play quietly, electric guitars. Drums, not so much. <laughs> now, we were lucky in that we were, that section of the song was slowed down. So I didn't have to worry about sync issues as much, which means I could do one or two takes and then be done. We also yeah. had a limited number of smoke grenades. <laughs> So we were They're only so expensive. Yeah. Like right. shockingly expensive. Yeah. I've looked at like breaking bottles is the other one. I'm always shocked that it's like those 30 are insane. bucks a bottle or something. I've yeah. looked at those several times yeah. and it's like, mm, maybe we find another way to do this before we commit. <laughs> Let's use real glass. I'm not paying. <laughs> yeah. I'll pay for stitches before I pay for these things. Um, so with this location, after that experience, there's a mm -hmm. lot of, it went very well off of that hitch, no issues whatsoever. Um, but there's a lot of anxiety associated with that. At any point, someone yeah. could come by and say, hey, you got to get out of here. And we would kind of have to be like, oh, all right, <laughs> that's the end of the shoot day, I guess. <laughs> yep. So knew I wanted to be in the middle of nowhere. And at the same time, because we were at that point operating with that orange and teal color palette, I liked the idea of shooting in a cabin because you have that wood, those natural mm -hmm. tones. Hey, guess what? Now you have a location that has a very nice warm orange hue yep. that immediately goes really well with what we're kind of trying to create. And then, you know, again, with that Wes Anderson style adherence to the color palette, suddenly it's like, okay, well, let's put our main character in that teal. You know, let's set our, you know, bed dressing, which is featured at two times during mm -hmm. the thing. Like, let's have, you know, those, those are one of the things that we brought in. Yep. I mean, an Airbnb would never have that color palette on a bed because it's hideous <laughs> apart from, from this video. Um, <clears throat> and and that's, that is what, you know, the scene that you end up seeing in the thumbnail. Mm -hmm. um, so those kind of things, the, um, the risk taking, and, and actually, so I will say uh, with this location in particular, the first thing that sealed the deal for me, I found this, it was an Airbnb, and I found this location, and the reason I immediately fell in love with it was because of the rafters. So yep. there's that scene where Baggins is up there um, and it's kind of, you know, dollying from left to right and it goes behind the banisters. Yep. When I was looking at this house, that is the shot that I That's envisioned. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we have to film here. That's and awesome. it's, it's interesting because we were originally going to be filming this in August. We had the date booked. We had the location booked. Everything was good to go. And then I got called in for jury duty. <laughs> <laughs> on that day now Delightful. yeah of course i was like you've got to be kidding me everything was good to go and then suddenly it's like just kidding who committed a crime we don't <laughs> yeah. do something yeah. there are important things happening here um so we had a, a discussion because um we had that booked but then it was kind of becoming clear at with our new timeline that we weren't going to be able to get a rebook that specific location mm -hmm. until october so we're already pushing our timeline. We were trying to go for, at that point, uh, an early September release. That was when we were still doing the split, you know, and everything seemed like it was going to be okay. Yep. Obviously, our turnaround August music video, September release was already very tight, as you can mm -hmm. definitely appreciate. So it was like, all right, do we try and find another location for that weekend and kind of keep our schedule moving or do we ask if the other band is cool with pushing our release back to try and stick with this house the release they ended up being pushed because it ended up working for them too for unrelated things so push the release back 
we rescheduled the house for October and I was thrilled. And I know they were too, because as soon as I was kind of explaining what I was seeing with this house, Dante and Sean were like, oh yeah, you're right. Like, that was my we, other we question gotta here. Stick with like, that. Yeah. For you as a director, it's like a, no, we need this house. And if I'm mm -hmm. Sean and Dante, like I think to their credit, they trust you. But like, I think it's also very rational for them to be like, can we just use a different house? Like mm -hmm. there's a million houses in the world. Like for sure we can find something else that has a log or has some interior wood. Like I, I think it speaks to their trust in you, but also like it, it would be very rational for them to be like, no, like everything on a band is on such a tight timeline and everything is like planned out and it feels like delaying a video two months like fucks up so many other moving pieces that Absolutely. i feel like oh, they yeah. would have had every right to be like dude fuck your vision like <laughs> yeah. get a get, new get vision over yourself we're, we're <laughs> switching plans yeah yeah and i think that speaks to yeah they're trusting you and also i guess yeah their willingness to see things through and yeah. make it happen no i've i've been lucky and you know i will say that the music video processes that we've done for the, the three that we've created, more so with post and better parts because they're more conceptual. Mm -hmm. Float, we just were kind of playing. You know, I have always kind of, it's been important to me to make sure that I'm explaining what I'm seeing as best I can to Sean and Dante because I want them to be involved. And they yeah. are, you know, like they had the, uh, you know, the, the influence with the, the paper bag, which arguably is the most distinctive part of the music is, video. Yeah. You know, I, at every turn, want to make sure that they are able to throw out their ideas. Actually, the so as we were trying to come up with our list of risks, uh, it was Sean who had the idea of the the knife, the mm -hmm. five finger game, yep. which I hadn't even thought of yet. And as soon as he said, I was like, "That's perfect," because that's yeah. such a distinctive visual thing. It's yeah. pretty iconic. Uh, it fits in perfectly because the other idea with the music video is, um the kind of story that may not be necessarily coming through is that the risk is supposed to kind of ramp up mm -hmm. a bit in intensity because the underlying story, you know, apart from just the risk taking is the idea that Baggins is a character who's kind of trapped in this routine. Yep. He's trapped in this house. He's doing these activities to try and feel something. And as he's trying and, and un, you know, being unsuccessful, he's kind of trying to ramp it up mm -hmm. in intensity. So let's see, we have, him kind of just like skating around and moving around the living room. And then we see him lighting a candle very close to his very <laughs> flammable face. And then we I move to the, the under it. <laughs> and yeah. The, yeah. And then, yeah. um, and then we move to the knife thing and then suddenly like, that's not enough. And then he has like this big climax in the mm -hmm. bridge where he's like kind of freaking out. And then when he has that moment, when he's laying down in the bed, he's like, all right, something needs to change. Mm -hmm. The very next shot is the first time we see him outside the house. Gotcha. It's also the first time that we kind of leave that Wes Anderson, very 90 degree shooting flat, mm -hmm. like symmetrical thing. Um, I'm getting a little off topic. So I do want to go back and say that Sean and Dante have contributed yeah. immensely to this thing. You know, I, I never want to be you know, like, oh, this is Mark's vision. Like, this is sure. our vision. We work together to, to, to put this out. Um, oh boy, I knew this was going to happen, but I don't remember what. No worries at all. There are two things you started up there this. that uh, that I want to touch on. So one of them, I guess, the simpler of the two is the knife thing you mentioned. The five finger, mm -hmm. uh, five finger roulette. What's the five finger? I, you know, something or I other? never really came up with a conclusive name <laughs> there, in my searching. I think it's like I'm sure an urban I think it's just called like something. five finger. <laughs> Okay. I think. Whatever. The thing know. with the knife that the I, knife yeah, game. we all know what we're talking about. Um, the what I liked most about that is the scene where he like opens a drawer and it's just the knife in there, which mm -hmm. to me is like you open the drawer as like a you open the fridge and see what you want to eat. You open the drawer and see which utensil you need. And the mm -hmm. idea that he was looking for choices and the only choice he had was this <laughs> ominous knife was like a yeah, somehow that was a really poignant moment to me. And I think a really well well done inclusion of like you could have just had the five finger game that he was mm -hmm. playing. But by including that, I liked the idea of like, yeah, he's looking for an option. He's hoping to see a good snack when he opens the mm -hmm. pantry and all it is is death in there there's nothing nothing good inside um so i like that uh and then the other piece was oh uh i talk about how a lot how like I'm, I'm a planner i'm a planner through and through like i i write notes out i write i'm working on a project now and i sent someone like a five-page document of like this is what i want and mm -hmm. it's like for sure there's a more efficient way to do that but to me it's like let me be thorough let me put all of this in your course so that you can ingest it all and make all the decisions and as i was getting into filming videos it's like things don't go to plan. Like that's just not part of what we do. Like yep. for as much as I'm a planner, I can't expect this plan to come to life, mm -hmm. uh, which then was kind of a dilemma of like, well, then why am I doing all this shit? But uh, I think your point about Dante and the the bag is a good thing of like, 
that's a very subtle change, but it's a hugely influential one. Absolutely. And that's yeah. a result of the plan. And so I, to me, it's like the plan exists so that I can make it better when I'm on set. The plan exists. So it's like, Hey, if we show up, this is the baseline of what's going to happen. But like, if we're on set and something better comes up, then great. We now have a firm baseline we can audible off of, and we have room now to improve. So instead yeah. of being on set and figuring out like, hey, should this be a square frame? Like how should we symmetrical? Like what what are we hoping for here? It's like, no, we've got all, all the nitty gritty lined up. So now that when we're getting closer to set or on set, whenever the idea comes together, it's like, yeah, now Dante has the mental freedom to be like, what about a bag? Yeah. And yeah. it ends up, yeah, where it's like if instead <coughs> alternatively show up on set going like, is this going to be bright? Is it going to be dark? Like you never get to the bag. Like there's so much other shit that you would have gotten lost in. Right. So to me as a planner, it's like, yeah, my goal of the plan is just to have something to deviate from. It just have something to improve off of. And we need this basic level so that we can show up and be confident on the day. But like, yeah, it's always going to de deviate. It's always going to vary. And so I think this is where like Mark as a director comes in. It's like your job as a director is to create that baseline. So then mm -hmm. Sean and Dante can just be creative and be artists and figure out how to enrich this thing. And like, yeah, think about it in the anthems perspective. Yeah. So just Mark, the filmmaker Absolutely. perspective. Yeah. And it's funny. So because, so our timeline from first initial idea conception to actually filming, and then obviously, you know, post-production comes mm -hmm. into play as well, was probably like two or three months. Gotcha. So this wasn't like, hey, we came up with this idea and then two weeks from now we're filming and yep. we're just executing. And so because of that, and because the idea evolved so much throughout the course of, of now, I will say, for those like two or three months, this music video kind of consumed me. As it does, yeah. Uh, like I could not, any any downtime when I wasn't working on something, it was like, okay, I was thinking about mm -hmm. what does this music video look like? What do we piece. need to do to prepare for that? Mm -hmm. But because it was so long, any little decision along that path branches it off and leads to something completely different, course, yep. which is great. You know, uh, the the very first music video that we conceived would have some similarities to what we ended up with, but it would look fairly unrecognizable from the end product, mm. you know, from the color scheme to, to Baggins, to the risks, to the location, like every little decision along the way and every discussion that we had about it along the way influenced it to where we finally ended up. And I'm very, you know, satisfied. Even the the idea to um, be influenced by Wes Anderson and mm -hmm. kind of go with that very flat, perfect, symmetrical look, uh, everything kind of added up to the to yeah. the final end product. And um, you know, I love thinking now that it's over. In the moment, <laughs> and and in the time period, is like stressful because it's like, oh man, how how are we gonna make this work? What Always. do we need to do? What's the budget? You know that house for you know it was a nice Airbnb, but it was listed to house much more than the five people that were a part of this production. Yeah. <coughs> so it was it was a pretty pretty yeah. yeah pretty penny, but it was worth it. Yeah. And I was able to you know kind of explain what I was seeing to Sean and Dante, and as soon as they heard that, they're like, yeah, like this this place would work out. Really was well. the location local ish? Like I don't necessarily need it was, address, so it was in, but like, it was it in New York. Yeah. Okay. Uh it was about three, three and a half so hours away. New York, I yeah. assume somewhere. It was actually it was pretty close to the corner of like the north east corner of Pennsylvania. So gotcha. it was a bit of a bit of a ways out there. The the key to location to me, one thing is, yeah, I was going to ask, like, I, I was hoping it was a friend or family member's house, but knowing mm -hmm. it was an Airbnb uh, adds cost, but it also means that all, like, the feather scenes become, like, a, a nightmare <laughs> of, like, we got to get every feather out of here because there's no <laughs> way they're going to be happy with this. And if they see a feather in here, we're getting charged an arm and a leg for the cleaning fee for them yeah. being like, what the fuck did they do in my house, <laughs> yeah. kind of. So as I yeah. saw that, yeah, I was like, what is this house? And... God forbid they had to rent it because this is not <laughs> something you want to try to do in a rental. So yes. So <laughs> where does where did the feathers come together? Yeah, talk I guess I'm asking both like uh creatively in the planning and also like day of onset, like what the fuck is going on when that's yeah. happening? So uh <laughs> one of the things that I, I think I remember taking a decent while to settle on was what does the bridge look like? Because yep. when we get to that point in the song, there's very much a vibe change not only because we move into you know we hear dante screaming but also the tempo changes mm -hmm. so it's like okay this change needs to kind of reflect in what's happening in the video i feel like it can't just be status quo we're just seeing the same thing we've had mm -hmm. um and you know there were there was kind of like the idea of like breaking and that idea of like the bagging tipping point, like this is where he's finally becoming so frustrated that mm -hmm. he, you know, kind of has this outburst. 
And we settled on feathers because it was easier than actually breaking things. <laughs> yep. Because for a while, I was we were trying to figure out like, okay, um, how do we discuss, like how do we figure out what to break? And, and I, I can't remember if this was before the podcast or on the podcast, we were talking about the idea of like glass bottles and it's like, okay, yep. well suddenly that's adding to the budget. Yeah. It's, um, you know, affecting how safe this production is. Mm -hmm. We're already going through a production where the main idea is taking risks. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, you want to make sure that you are trying to be safe and yeah. no one's going to get hurt. So feathers seemed like a good option um, where it could be visually interesting and stunning, but also still be safe. And it also has that link to the very beginning of the music video. The first time we see Baggins where he's lying down, you know, the it's it's intentionally mirrored when we see him collapse onto the bed and we see him from the top down and suddenly it's no longer perfect. That perfection is gone. Yeah. He's reached his tipping point. Now everything is messy and scattered and he realizes he makes, needs to make the change. But I will say that <laughs> the result of that shot was probably about two hours with two <laughs> vacuums up in that room trying to make sure, like you said, everything was cleaned up. We didn't want them to... Uh, walk in and be like, what the <laughs> fuck happened yeah. in here? Um, and I will say, when you buy, I don't remember how many pounds of feathers, yep, which when was... you're measuring feathers in pounds, it's a lot of fucking feathers. <laughs> um, a lot less than a pound of bricks, though, I'll tell you <laughs> yeah, what. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's funny, because when you buy them, they're in this big bag. It looks like mm -hmm. a kind of a body pillow, but <clears throat> they're all fairly compressed. Yep. So... You know, as we were kind of taking that bag and filling the the pillows that he eventually does kind of throw around, suddenly it's like, oh, okay, well, this doesn't seem like a lot. Actually, when I got the first bag, I was like, oh, did I get enough? Like, are we going to have enough to, to do this? And then as we're filling them and they kind of decompress and like have the air and it's like, oh my gosh, we have a lot of feathers here. This is going to be a nightmare. It also meant that we only had one take to do that shot. Yes. Um, because we were not going to be cleaning up feathers for two hours <laughs> and then doing it and again. Restarting, yeah. Um, That's funny. Which was a bit sh stressful because it was like, we this is it. This is the one thing. But we kind of, uh, we ran through it beforehand. We were like, okay, you're going to you're gonna walk up. Yep. You're going to grab this pillow. You're going to swing it this way. You're going to do this. And then after the first kind of initial things, it's like, go to town. Like, this is what, it was kind of more traditional actor and director relationship where it's like this is the emotion that you're feeling in this scene take it and run with it do it yeah. and there is no over the top yeah. like over the top is what we're aiming for so you know that particular room you have the the main bed at the end under the windows but there were also you can kind of see it in the wide shot with the feathers there were other beds there so baggins goes over to those and grabs those sheets and, and starts uh flinging those around we actually lucked out because those beds oh Jesus, that's new. I that makes me so mad, dude. I uh, I had old chairs and they fell so much. They did that all the time, and so I went and I got nice new chairs. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> it's, great. It, nothing's wrong. With it. It's my fault because my ankle. Oh, thank God. Triggered. If I thank there goodness. We go. I, oh, that I, makes I, me feel so much better, dude. So I, it's, <laughs> it's my fidgeting that has ruined your set. That is <laughs> the best news ever. It was such a nightmare to like be editing and like have to constantly readjust like the height of the frame because mm. someone had fallen lower to frame and then I looked like a giant sitting next to them <laughs> and whatever. And that happened. That yes, brought it, you're me. <laughs> literally that. Um, as you're bringing the feathers thing up, it reminded me, uh, I connected the idea with Seth Rogen and I don't know exactly why. I think maybe he was talking about an interview or something. Uh, and one thing uh, in the movie, The Interview, where they go to like North Korea mm -hmm. and they interview, um, and a couple other movies he's done it as well. But I guess one thing Seth Rogen really likes to do and did in that movie is like explode people mm. <laughs> uh, and film a scene of like, yeah, someone exploding. And he was laughing of like, you don't realize how much like fake blood you need to like make it look cool. Like mm -hmm. the amount of fake blood in a human is not enough to, or I guess the amount of real blood in a human <laughs> right. is not enough to like fill the room and make the cinematic effect that we want. Like mm -hmm. you need an absurd amount of fake blood. Uh, and I was thinking about the feathers of like, yeah, it's your point. It's like, I, it's very easy to order and like a pound of feathers has to be enough. And then it arrives and it's like, oh fuck. I didn't realize <laughs> like how much we need to make this not just like, what a pillow would be, but like what a cinematic pillow yes, would create. Absolutely. Like those are very different things of like, yeah. And Seth Rogen, it's like, 
I don't care how much blood's in a person. I care about how this thing looks when it, how it explodes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, and so for him, it's like, yeah, the amount of blood we use, I don't remember what the number was, but it was like a hundred gallons or some like absurd amount of like, this would be the biggest person of all time, but like <laughs> for it to work on camera, because if you use like the actual amount of feathers in a pillow or blood in a person, then it like, it feels uh, underwhelming. It mm-hmm. doesn't deliver in the way. Mm-hmm. So as I was watching that, I had the interesting thought, and yeah, glad you brought up the the mention there of like, yeah, how do you measure how many feathers are enough to like, yeah, we know how many are in a pillow. We can kind of figure that out. But mm-hmm. like how many looks good on camera and yeah, how do we make this thing sell the way it's supposed to? Well, it's funny because on top of that, with the pillows specifically, so we ended up just putting the feathers directly into the cases. Yep. Now, that's not how pillows work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so earlier in the, the process, we're like, okay, well, so does Baggins like take out a knife and like rip open a pillow? And then like, so that's how he kind of gets mm-hmm. at the feathers. But when you're talking about doing one take, it's like, hey, and and I'll being safe, you know, yeah. of course, uh, the knife had to be sharp enough to rip open a pillow. It's like, suddenly this doesn't seem plausible in one take. Yeah. There are so many things that could go wrong. And if it goes wrong, you know, we don't get the shot we want. So uh, to your point, we were like, let's just put the the feathers in the pillowcase. It'll look like a pillow when it's on the bed. Yep. And then as soon as he has that moment where he grabs it and, and rips it around and, you know, it kind of flies out in that arc towards mm-hmm. the camera, like, no one's going to – some people might. Yeah. I, I probably would. Uh, where it's like, hmm, that's not how pillows work. Yeah. But for the most part, it gets at the emotion yep. and the look that we're trying to have. And so that's way more important than yeah. trying to – you know, properly show how pillows most work. Most <laughs> people aren't like me, and most people didn't Google the book and try and figure out what this book could well, possibly be. Well, it's funny, be. Yeah. and that's one of the reasons why I was looking forward to talking to you so much, because I know that as a video guy, yeah. you do see those things. Yeah. And while there was a lot of attention to detail in this video, things will fall through the cracks. Always. And, and I, yeah. I love hearing that you <laughs> kind of saw that and then took it upon yourself to, to look at that. Yeah. That's amazing to me. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, it was fun. I think it's uh, it's twofold to me, right? I think one version is like the, I think about like the Starbucks cup in Game of Thrones is like the classic yep. example yep. where they left that in. And like, it, I think everything's on purpose. And to me, it's like in the context of Game of Thrones, I don't think there's that many people on set who overlook that. Mm. I like... I think either someone like intentionally put it there as like, fuck you, camera guy, like <laughs> yeah. some version yep. of that. Mm-hmm. But even then, it's like there's so many layers of posts that would have to go through. It's like someone could have edited that out. Like it's mm-hmm. very edit outable. <laughs> well, like, it's it's it, funny because there were I had things like that on this set. Yeah, there was um, in float as well. Post, not so much because everything was very intentionally mm-hmm. placed and we were filming in an open field. So. Yeah. Uh, there was a water bottle in the background of Float, mm-hmm. and it pissed me off so much when I was editing. No yep. one's gonna see it. Yep. Some people might. If you if you if you're eagle eyed, you'll see it. But I was like, oh, that's clearly not supposed to be there. But whatever. Yep. In better parts, because everything is so intentional, I tried to be yep. so much better about that. Um, and things still showed up in frame, and I didn't see it until editing. And it's like, crap. But now this is everything is so intentional. Yeah. Luckily. Um, now with like Photoshop generative fill and all that stuff, I I was able to take all that stuff out after the fact. And because everything is shot on a tripod, it was the easiest thing in the world to do. So, so (laughs) if you do go now and see something that is not supposed to be in the background of better parts, I will be very surprised because I was like watching that, like a hawk, like, nope, all right, take this out there. I think there were like five or six things that I ended up taking out. Not all of it was mistakes, but it was stuff that I decided probably shouldn't be in there after the fact. So we just took it out. Uh, you just hit the softest spot. Uh, I was telling you before we got on about a project I'm working on currently. And so in the project, uh, it's a guitar player and an amp. Uh, and one of the questions we had is on the amp, there's all the different lights. And one of the lights was like flashing in a take and it wasn't supposed to be flashing. Mm. It needed to be solid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we do the thing. And then at the end, there's like a, a, a speak over part of like, hey, my name is blah, blah, blah. I just filmed such and such. Here's the product kind of. And in that last little talking part, the light was blinking. So I had the first thought of you of like, oh, it's on a tripod, easy. I can mm-hmm. just crop it out or yeah, fix it, no problem. The problem is as he goes, my name is such and such, there's a thing, he touches the amp and it shakes just a little bit. Oh, so no. then last night I'm sitting there going like, it's not a shake, like a visible shake, but it's like enough that if I don't address this thing, then there's this weird wobble that doesn't make mm-hmm. sense. So last night was me going like frame by frame of like, 
how much did the amp move? An eighth of an inch here? Like, when did it move an eighth of an inch yeah. to try to figure out all those little annoying details? So I'm envious that you had a clean tripod, but no one messed with your plans there. Well, it's funny. I, I really do empathize because there was, of the, I don't know, maybe five or six that I, things that I removed, one of them happened, and there was a rack focus. There you go. So it's the exact same thing. I'm not going to yeah. tell you where it is, but there aren't many rack focuses in the yeah. music video. <laughs> but there is a moment where... Um, you know, it, it's focused on one thing and I masked it out and all that and it was fine. And then suddenly there was a rack focus. And I actually, I toyed around with like animating like a blur yeah. onto it to try and, you know, get that one circle where yeah. I masked something out <laughs> as blurry as when it rack focused. Yeah. And it got to the point where it was good enough, but I did eventually chalk that up to, I will obsess over this. 99 people out of 100 won't ever probably 99.99 yeah. percent of people won't ever notice this someone yeah. like you might and anyone that's watching this that is now going to go and watch better sure. parts <laughs> might. i don't yeah. know who would do that but they might notice it yeah um but, but it's funny because i understand that completely. to me to that person it's like good i'm glad like i don't uh there's two parts here so the classic story i always tell is in my first guitar playthrough we're like on a beach or whatever and the guitar is not plugged in mm -hmm. and we post it and like the only comment we get is that the guitar is not plugged in yes. which at the time yep. was like so infuriating to me of like you missed the point and now it's like if you watch the whole video and the only thing you complain about is that it wasn't plugged in like mission accomplished Beautiful. everything else must be good uh so that's one but i feel like i say that on here all the time the part two of that to me is like yeah if you care enough to figure this out like great and also like uh, I heard wisdom that like most things are done at 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's imperfect in the context of creative endeavors. Like we don't want to stop our music video 80% of the way through the edit and not go through. But like most people are consuming like, oh, the song sounds good. Yeah. Oh, there's a guy in a bag. Like they're not thinking about what's in the background or what's good. Like there's so many layers that like we're obsessing over that never make it. And so to me, the 80% rule has been really freeing of like the first 80% is worth getting right perfect like it, it mm -hmm. should be good and not 80 percent like in chronology but like the bulk of the video, the gist of it is worth getting right and that last 20 percent of making sure the blurs line up is like that's for me yeah like just make me happy and once i'm happy with it great because that's all preference stuff and yeah the other 80 percent is what everyone else is going to see they're going to see yeah a guy who looks they're going to yeah look at sean and dante and you and be like oh they're cute oh i don't like them like that's what most people are thinking. They're never yeah. going to get to the blur or the thing in the background. Oh, absolutely or like, not. There's so many other pieces that they have to get past before they would even start to think about that. Where it's like, yeah, if you've made it through all those steps, now you're worried about the blurs. Like, cool. But, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Well, and it's funny because I, I am a huge sucker for behind the scenes mm -hmm. things. Like anytime there's a behind the scenes video for a music video or like in the studio videos or like tour diaries, I eat that shit up. Yeah. So anyone that is engaging with our stuff to the point where they're interested enough to either look at behind the scenes stuff or try and analyze like what we're mm -hmm. doing and why we did it, yeah. that's incredible to me. And I, I fully understand and respect that. So that's amazing. That's, yep. that's, that would be wonderful to, to hear. Hell yeah. Um, I wanted to, yeah, I guess last piece here is then the, the roof part of this. You mentioned, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the initial thing. Uh, it seems... Yeah, talk to me about filming that. How do we get back on the roof, back ends on the roof? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and I, uh, yeah, there's the drone circling. Like, it it seems like a, one of those shots that should seem simple. And then on the day of, it takes so much time to, like, communicate, like, yell to the person on the roof, like, hey, climb 10 feet down. I have yes. to circle the drone again. <laughs> yeah, and then, like, exactly. the drone has to do a full circle again. It doesn't just, like, go back and forth. It's not on a dolly. It's not. Right, yeah, right. Right. So, yeah. What is that roof process like, that last shot? Is it the last thing you film? Yeah. What is that process like? Yes. So, um, that was, it was a lot of fun to do. So, when we were looking at the location and we were looking at this house on the Airbnb, that was one of the things, because we had already had the drone shot planned, yeah. we're like, okay, hey, is there a way that we can get up onto the roof? And as you'll see from some of the exterior shots and actually from the single artwork, which is the same house, um, there's like kind of a wraparound porch. And there okay. was an area on the other side where you can, the the porch stuck out a little bit further than the roof did. Perfect. So, uh, and, and in the spirit of being prepared and having everything we need, I brought a ladder with me, a ladder that was tall enough to, to be able to get on the roof with no problem. Yeah. In the spirit of safety, we already knew we were doing something risky. So let's try and do <laughs> everything we can yeah. to mitigate yeah. any risk. So... Uh, going kind of back to that idea of having someone whose identity was hidden so that, um, you know, we could have one of us replace the actor if we needed to. 
um, I knew that that one would be particularly tough because um, Nick, who is our cinematographer, who d does an excellent job, I was kind of having uh, a discussion with him early on. I was like, hey, like, have you flown a drone? Are you comfortable with flying drones? And he's like, and, and now, as someone who does fly, the drones have come long enough, far enough that like, mm -hmm. I, I do believe that anyone can fly them. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, you know, hey, if this needs to happen, if if I need to be the one to go up on the roof, I can give you the drone. Um, luckily, that did not happen, and I was able to operate the drone for that shot. But the challenge was, because it was the first time that we were outside, it was very weather dependent. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I also wanted it to be as beautiful as possible, because th that was kind of the the moment where, Baggins is freeing himself from the cycle. He's mm -hmm. no longer in the house. That is kind of like his, uh, I don't know, the the realization of his character. Um, and so originally, as we were trying to fit that into the schedule of the day, um, we thought we were going to have to wake up very early on our last day and get that because I wanted to try and get it with a sunrise or a sunset. And the day we were filming everything we did it we did most of the shoot in one day mm -hmm. on a saturday it was very cloudy so we weren't going to get any kind of beautiful sunrise or sunset uh and it was just going to be like flat gray yeah. not really what we were looking for so we had kind of resigned ourselves to waking up at you know whatever five in the morning and doing that but around dinner time when the sun was starting to go down the it wasn't necessarily the sun didn't come out, but the clouds started to break up a bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was suddenly a bit of a visual interest to the sky at that point. But it was tough because it had been gray and kind of a little rainy earlier in that morning. So the roof was slippery. And the roof uh, was a lot steeper yeah. than it, when, when you're actually up there. I wasn't the one up there. I, I was yeah. filming the drum. So I, I don't speak from experience here. But there were, there were a couple, like moments where there were some close calls i'll say and, and shingles so are more slippery than you'd think because they've just been weathered down right yeah if they're brand new shingles they have grip tape on them but mm -hmm. like yeah i assume they're weathered and also like the bag has eye holes but like that's not the same as like oh, being able to see it, absolutely like, yeah. I assume, yeah vision's reduced at the very least if you're seeing at all yeah like, except for all i know the bag is like not aligned properly so yeah you're kind of boned you can see your toes and that's about it maybe no we we learned pretty quickly on the set that uh, you don't really see well <laughs> outside of that mask. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're trying to keep it positioned well. Yeah. And like, we, yeah. you know, we had a couple things where like we're putting gaff tape on the top of the head <laughs> to try yeah. and secure the bag there. So it was a little bit tricky with the roof shot. Um, <clears throat> luckily, you know, we that was the point where, again, safety was priority. So I wasn't worried about like, you know, especially when Baggins was walking up the roof. We weren't worried about like he has to be upright and like proudly, you know, <laughs> striding up. Up, it's yeah. like no, you can like kind of climb up, be on all fours, because that's how someone would get up that yeah. roof in that situation. So we had the one shot of kind of coming from behind, uh, where that was the only time that Baggins was actually in motion, um, and it was with him being as you know low down to the roof as he was. It ended up being safe enough that it wasn't an issue. And actually, I, I toyed with, um, I'm, I'm curious if you notice this, because it's fairly subtle, but that actually turned into a dolly zoom effect, where uh, as it was going over, you know, the background kind of like distorts. Interesting. Um, because I just animated, I mean, I was working with enough resolution that I animated the scale of the drone shot. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, it kind of had that like bit of distortion mm -hmm. effect. I don't know. That's probably getting too technical f for this, but it's there. And then the circling shot, because that was already going to be difficult enough, framing him up, getting a nice view of the landscape, and also you know avoiding any trees and stuff, because we were kind of next to the woods. Um, Baggins is stationary in that shot. You know, he, he mm -hmm. was directed to kind of look around um, and you know kind of take in that literal breath of fresh air, because um, that's what's happening for the character in that moment. But, um, you know, it was tricky. It took a couple times, but we did eventually get that shot. And I, I think once that happened, it was kind of like, mm, this, this has to be the, yeah. the climax, the conclusion, yeah. if you will. So, Hell yeah. Um, 
we've spent almost an hour talking about that one video, which yeah. is to me the best shit ever. <laughs> I so knew like, this Kevin, was going to happen. So, uh, that's yeah. rad as hell. Uh, I wanted to transition kind of into like a more general film background for you. So sure. you mentioned like the Wes Anderson. You've used a lot of technical terms here, which tells mm -hmm. me that like I have – I don't know anything about Wes Anderson, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Like I, I, I'm shockingly illiterate in the context of movies and like just media in general. Like I, I like music. I've seen a lot of music videos, but like I've never really been a film person. Like I'm mm -hmm. just now trying to like make myself sit down and watch movies with the idea of like, yeah, whoever the best person with a camera is probably isn't doing music videos. Like probably they're in yeah, yeah, Hollywood. Right. They're yep. working mm -hmm. with a bajillion dollar budget, not with a band budget. So like I'm like actively trying to force myself to sit down and like become more of a film guy and like understand that that is enriching to me in some way. And mm -hmm. even if I don't love the movie, like there will be a shot in there that resonates with me or I'll, yeah observe the thirds of the symmetry that you guys use really well like i'll observe symmetry and be like oh what if i use symmetry kind yeah. of thing mm -hmm. it sounds like you've got a more profound film background like yeah did you grow up watching movies all the time did you go to film school like what is your kind of film background here so i will say short answer is no okay. so so i well all right so i did go to film school okay uh i went to fairfield university and i didn't go f to like with the intention i kind of fell into it after okay. the fact um, and it's, it's funny, there's, there, the, the, my life as a musician and my life as a filmmaker did kind of, you know, they were, they were intertwined. Mm -hmm. I won't get into it now cause I know we're, we're running short on time. Oh, we got all the time in the world. That wasn't, yeah. Uh, we don't need to have any cutoff here at all. So, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, more uh, than curious. Yeah. so maybe I'll get into that, but to answer your first question. So I did go to film school, but that being said, um, I will be the first person to tell anyone that film school is not necessary sure. for what we do. Um, you know, any information that you need is, uh, you know, online. And I, I, I've always disliked people who are like, oh, I went to film school. Mm -hmm. I'm, I know more than you. Because that's absolutely not true. And, yeah. and actually, I think uh, the benefit to where I did go to, to school was um, – just that they enabled you and empowered you to go out and film things, which to me is the best way to learn. Yeah, School or no school, if you go out and create, you're going to learn how to, how to do this. But I will say, I'm very much like you in that I'm not really a movie buff. Uh, you know, I, I threw out Wes Anderson and stuff a lot. And, you know, part of that is because there was a big, like, social media trend last year. And part of that was Asteroid City, which was his new movie just came out, which gotcha. I haven't seen. I've never but, heard of but it. But I yeah. did. But I did, you know, I, I saw some screenshots and I was like, oh, that's a very interesting color palette. Yeah. I'll try and, you know, maybe yep. use that. But I haven't seen the movie. And I've always been the worst at, like, yeah. all of, like, the classic movies. It's It either took me forever to see them or I just haven't seen them yet. I'm doing my best. <laughs> what did I, I just watched a Boondock Saints the other time for the I first time. I haven't seen that. So <laughs> That's one. one <laughs> yeah, for me. There we go. Uh, I just saw that. I just saw uh, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I have seen that. I just watched that for the what'd first you, time. What do you think of that? I'm too stupid for multiverses. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does get a little... It gets weird, and I feel like it's, it's like that's kind of the point too. Like it, yeah. it wanted to get a little bit out yeah. there, which I think um, is is nice. But, but uh, yeah, your film background. So we do go to film school. Uh, I've heard a uh, Zadak was on here. Zadak Brooks. No idea what episode number it was. Episode mm -hmm. somewhere between one and fifty four. <laughs> he was on <laughs> here. Uh, but he went to school. I think for graphic design or some kind of art school, and I believe it was for design. Uh, and his big takeaway that always resonated with me is like he had a similar point to you of like really the, what I gained the most was from being at my computer and like just trying stuff, going out and making stuff. Um, but he talked about how like the process of taking feedback was something that school mm. breaks into you. Whereas for someone like me, it's like no one's ever really told me they don't like my art. Yeah. Like, and I'm sure those people exist. I'm not saying that my art is flawless, but just that like when I'm working for a band, I send it to a band and most of the time they say, great. Yeah. And so the one time someone says, Fuck no. It's like, whoa, what, <laughs> whoa. The, what the hell? <laughs> that is a personal attack. Yeah. Whereas with Zadak, it's like, no, every week my teacher said fuck no to mm. me. So like it really gets you into that mode of like taking feedback and ingesting that there's so many diverse ways to do this. And like, yeah, not that that is mandatory to being a good artist, but like that's part of being a, a business. It's part of like, yeah. not that in painting the Mona Lisa, you need to be aware of that. But if you're going to try and paint the Mona Lisa every week and like, yeah, you got to be aware of other people's feedback and how you can ingest that and take it in honestly and not take it personally. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds like maybe, or I'm, I guess I'm asking like, was film school a similar thing? Like you said that the, the big takeaway was going out and doing it, but I would assume that you come back to the classroom and your teacher is sometimes saying, great shot, Mark. And sometimes they're being like, why the fuck did you? <laughs> so, um, so that's interesting. And I think that's right. Um, but for me, I do think that, um, 
what I really liked and appreciated about film school, and for me, I think it is the the strongest argument for going for anyone that is thinking, uh, in addition to the feedback, because I think that is a valid point, but I really liked the structure. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was one class that I took. It was called, I think it was just called like Lights, Camera, Action. And essentially it was like, it, I took it my first year, which was a sophomore because I didn't go in as a film major. Um, and it was like, hey, this is everything you need to know about production. And what I really liked about it is we would learn about some aspect of production, lighting, whatever. And then we would go out and we would have to film something that kind of demonstrate mm -hmm. demonstrated your understanding of that that idea. And so that structure where it's like, hey, you're you're going out every week and you're creating something. Yeah. And these some things are designed to be different. So you are having a lot of experience doing multiple different things. Yeah. That is is huge. You know, on top of that, I was very lucky to go to a film school. You know, you have a lot of these these high end film schools where I feel like for the first two years they teach theory. And then maybe if you're a junior, you get lucky and you start like getting to use equipment and go out and I make took stuff. one film class and the f it was going to be a seminar every week. And we were supposed to sit down and watch. It was from like noon to six. And we were going to sit down and watch a movie from noon to three, pause, another movie from three to six. Mm. And I sat down for 10 minutes. I was like, fuck this. Like, I'm literally <laughs> never going to do it. Like, this is, I'm not paying money to come sit and watch movies for two hours. with Like, fuck this. Dude, yeah. This is so fucking dumb. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think if I had had someone be like, Instead of watching movie for three hours, let's watch one scene from The Departed and then go try and emulate that thing. That would have been such a better learning tool than someone yeah. being like, watch two movies, stay awake, figure out how to yeah, stay awake yep. in this dark room. Theory for me was always my least favorite part. Yeah. I loved the production side. Yeah. I still do. Uh, you know, it's why why I do it, why we do it. Um, but yeah, no, just the, the fact that you were able to go out and, and at where I was, freshman year or... Mm -hmm. I didn't start freshman year, but yeah. right at the beginning of the program, they're like, yep, here's a camera. Here's a Sony EX-1. Mm -hmm. Just go out, make something. You can rent this out whenever. Um, yep. You know, we had cameras that went up to like red cameras. I mean, our best one was like Red Scarlet. This was also like almost 10 years ago at this point. So um, still has the brand name on it. Yeah. Exactly. So like, you know, we got a chance to really get our hands on some really nice equipment and you had to go through a progression to get there. But like just the fact that we had access yeah. to that kind of stuff, like that to me, is why film school was nice. And obviously that's also not all film schools. But that being said, you know, filmmaking is not about the camera that you use. It's not about the lights you use. It's not about your equipment. It's yeah. about telling a story and, and yeah. how can you best communicate what you're trying to say. And you can do that with anything. You can do that with phones, you know, these days. Everyone yeah. says that. This is not a new, yeah. you know, revolutionary idea. But um, so while I did go to, to film school, it's never really been like the, oh, if I didn't do that, because I did have uh, like a love for filming before mm -hmm. school. Was that your first time being exposed to cameras? You in high school making shitty movies with your friends? <laughs> like, is there a, a middle school? Yeah, for me, it's I'm sitting down. I started to learn guitar, mm -hmm. uh, and I am not musically gifted. And so very quickly, what I realized is like, hey, I like filming these covers of myself, but I hate learning the songs and doing right. the music part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, yeah, me filming with like, the front camera on my MacBook. And it's like, how do I position my laptop? How do I put my laptop on a bookshelf and like mm -hmm. get put a book under it so I get the right angle? And like, yeah, that's that's the camera I'm starting with. And that's kind of my... Uh, and then one of my buddies, like uh, one of my few friends I'm still in touch with from like childhood mm -hmm. uh, was like, hey, do you ever filming those like soccer videos in your basement? And it was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And it turns out we had back in the day, like back when like trick shots and dude perfect and all oh, like, yeah. the, yep. all those things are huge. Yeah, we had tried to do some little versions of that that I had no memory of, mm -hmm. but it was kind of an interesting thing of like, oh, I didn't realize how long I've been making videos. Like I thought this was like an adult thing that I kind of got into as mm -hmm. I got older. And it's like, no, I've kind of always been doing this and just doing it in much shittier forms. Yeah, like, yeah, where's yeah. your first shitty form of making videos? <laughs> Maybe they were the masterpiece. I don't mean to no, discredit No, no, no. Shitty is the correct word. Mathematically speaking, it's probably, yeah, not quite that. <laughs> oh, man, I brought the coffee fit out. That's it's mission accomplished. Yeah, here. there we go. <laughs> Great Excuse success me. to me. Um, uh, no, Mark's been under the weather for a little bit. So this is him braving through and making it happen. So I appreciate you yeah, yes. making it happen for us. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, very first... F foray into filmmaking was yeah. when I was super young. Yeah. So I, I remember um, there was a year where uh, my parents gifted actually one of my older brothers like a little video camcorder thing. And then for a period of a while, 
couple years probably, my brothers and my cousins when they were around for like the holidays were kind of just like filming very fun, silly. Like I remember we yeah. filmed our own version of A Christmas Carol. <laughs> Which I think at one point featured like a talking wolf puppet. So like very, they were fun. Yeah. Obviously, you know, I look back fondly. Yeah. Um, But silly. So I alluded before to the fact that my uh, path as a filmmaker and my path as a musician are very intertwined. So while I have that very um, early story of of filmmaking, you know, with my brothers and my cousins... um, it wasn't, I didn't really revisit the idea of filming things, at least as far as I can remember, until high school. But uh, the form that that took was, at the time, you know, I was in my first band. Um, and I would always take it upon myself. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that I love the idea of behind the scenes and, and studio vlogs and stuff. So whenever we were recording music, I would always take it upon myself for fun just to film the process. You know, us having fun um, At the time we were filming, uh, we were recording our second release in my first band. And so I was just kind of like documenting it and I would, you know, edit that together and release it and put it up on YouTube. I I had, you know, my parents get me like this, I think it was called like Power Director, which was kind of your standard nonlinear editor, uh, got the job done, but I would just kind of edit stuff on that. Um, And then I kind of kept doing that and then... When I got into my second band, I did a similar thing. Every time we were recording or, or anything, I, I recorded that. And I, I really enjoyed doing that. And when I went to school, so for the longest time, my I thought my path in life was going to be um, teaching. Uh, so I went to school for teaching. I, I went to Fairfield University, which had a good teaching program. Like teaching math, like teaching so, academic uh, teaching, or like teaching music lessons, like teaching Teaching what? history. Okay. So... How it worked is I had to choose my, – my major was technically history, and then eventually I would get, like, a minor in education, and that's how the program worked. And at the end of my freshman year, I was kind of like, mm, I don't really want to do this anymore. Not because I didn't want to teach anymore, because I had to do, like, research papers and history <laughs> stuff, and I was like, man, that kind of sucks. Like I like history <laughs> now, and I did not like it back well, then for that it's, reason. It's, yeah. it's funny because my, my big thing was like, oh, I like history. Yeah. As a teacher, I feel like I could make history interesting. Mm-hmm. That was kind of my motivation. Um, and then I went through college history class, and I was like, wow, this really <laughs> sucks. Um, yeah. So I was kind of having this like crisis at the end of my freshman year, like, oh, man, this was my plan for so long. What the hell do I do now? And it was actually a conversation I was having with my mother at the time who was like, hey, you always really liked making those like like film vlogs and and edits and stuff like that for your old bands. I I resonate with a mom who doesn't really understand the (laughs) band world but is trying her best to be supportive and is like your little skit thingies that you and your friends would do. Um, And and I will say to my mom's credit, she had a, a decent grasp on it. But she's like, hey, you always love doing that. What if you looked into seeing if your school has a film program? Mm hmm. And as luck would have it, there were a couple people I met throughout the year that were a part of the program. I had seen a couple like uh, shots from sets that they had, mm-hmm. and I remember seeing like the big camera and like the dollies and like the boom pole, and I was yeah. like, "Oh man, that stuff looks really cool." Yeah. Anyway, like moving <laughs> on to yeah, because I wasn't focused on it. Yeah. And the dorm that I was going to be moving into sophomore year, the head of the film program, uh, I went to a Jesuit school. So one of the priests that ran the program happened to just reside in the dorm I was going to be living in. So I went and had a conversation with him, learned about the film program. I thought I was going to be talking to him for like 15 minutes. And we had like a two and a half hour conversation. Gotcha. And I I like was like, this sounds awesome. I, like, this sounds like a blast. Sign me up. Yeah, sign me up. I'm in. And then the rest was just kind of history. So it's it's kind of because I was in local bands and doing just fun work for them that I ended up following this path to be a filmmaker. Interesting. Uh, I want to touch on the music part as well. So yeah, we've <laughs> talked a lot about you as a director and we yeah. barely touched the fact that you're also uh-huh. drumming sure. in this yep, music yep. video. So you also, <laughs> yeah, that's where the, so the cinematographer comes in. I assume is like, yeah, I can't be drumming and film myself. Let's 100%. delegate a little bit here. Yep. Uh, where does the drumming start? Are you four years old banging on pots and pans? And yeah, feel free to help yourself if you yeah, need a refill so, here. No, um, um, so yeah, are you banging pots and pans as a four year old? Are you getting into guitar as a kid? Yeah. Where's your musical journey begin? Um, it started in fourth grade. Okay. Um, and the reason I, I can say that definitively. Yeah, it's very precise. <laughs> yeah. Um, is because fourth grade, I went to a kindergarten through eighth grade school. So fourth grade is the year that 
you kind of move on from like the shitty recorders uh, and you decide like, okay, I'm going to be in the concert band oh, yeah. or I'm going to be in I was a the cellist, choir. Baby. <laughs> yeah, there no. we <laughs> Actually, I did I did play cello back when it was bigger than me and then that didn't last very long. Anyway, um, so fourth grade was when, when you kind of decide if you want to be in the concert band. And at the time, so I have two older brothers, as I mentioned, and they were both drummers. Now... I don't think that that influenced me that much. I don't think it was like, oh, hey, they were drummers. I'm going to be drummers, mm -hmm. a drummer too. I think it was something that I was genuinely interested in. And I feel like, I, I don't know if this is factually accurate, but I seem to remember being told that my dad was a drummer. Um, not in the traditional sense, like on drums, or at least not that I ever saw. He maybe when he was younger. Okay. But like I always kind of interacted with that like, you know, him, you know, drumming on a steering wheel or something oh, like that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> so I can't say to the extent that that's, you know, in my family, but yeah. fourth grade, I became a drummer. Now, that started in a concert band, so I wasn't on a drum set. Right. I was on snare drum, or I was on bass drum, mm -hmm. or, a, you know, auxiliary <laughs> percussion, or whatever. Um, Which so, almost feels degrading to me, always, yeah, when I'm it, watching, it, like, a big different. orchestra. Yeah, uh -huh. like, I know I'm just underestimating how complicated their snare patterns are, where it's like, yeah, at a certain level of marching line, like you kind of only can use one drum because mm -hmm. you're doing so much with it. But like, as as a as a kid, when I was watching the thing perform, it was like, this is one instrument. Why are we like? <laughs> right. I play one string of the cello and you play the next. Yeah, like, what exactly. the fuck is this? Uh huh. Well, and that's fair. And at the time, we certainly weren't playing yeah. any, anything complicated. <laughs> yeah. But so that's how I started, and I actually learned how to read music. Yeah. Uh, sheet music. <clears throat> it wasn't until probably about sixth or seventh grade that I finally sat down on a drum set for jazz band. Now, this was still an extracurricular mm -hmm. after school thing, but it was the first time that I was going from, hey, I'm focusing on this one thing to now I have all of these things in front of me. Um, and it's funny, um, my, my transition from being in to like a, a school after curricular, you know, school mm -hmm. concert thing into actually just being in a band, I feel like is fairly unique because it, it did actually start as a school project. So uh, at my school at the time, there was like this uh, program called the Enrichment Program. And the best way that I can kind of describe that is it understood that education can kind of come from anywhere. And it was like the passion for learning for like the sake of learning. That's wise of your school. To yeah. Uh, and, and we were lucky that we had that. And, and I think the best way to kind of demonstrate that is at the end of the year, <clears throat> they had like this enrichment fair. And it was kind of like a science fair. Um, but you can kind of do your project and your presentation on anything. Um, I remember one year, I, I literally had a presentation on if people can tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi. And I had like this diagram and I had little cups of Coke and Pepsi set up and I was doing tests and stuff like that. So they never really, it was very rare that I, they would say like, no, you can't do your project on that. So it, come eighth grade, you know, a couple of my buddies who were also in that jazz band who I'd been friends with for years came up to me and they were like, hey, what if, what if we made a band for our project, mm -hmm. for our enrichment project? Um, and I'll never forget they came up to me and they were, uh, they were like, hey, can you, do you think you could play this song? And it was Longview by Green Day. Um, and at the time, interestingly enough, I, I feel like I kind of have a reverse process here, but I didn't really learn anything from ear because I had sheet, sheet music. music yeah. um, so I was listening to it. I was like, yeah, that sounds like, that's a super cool part. It's, it's obviously got the, the drum intro and the bass. <clears throat> and I was like, that sounds pretty dope. And then we ended up, so we learned that song. We learned Holiday by Green Day. I'm sure you're seeing a pattern here mm -hmm. because we essentially kind of became a Green Day cover band yeah. for, for this project. And it was fun because by the time that fair came around, we were set up in the cafeteria and our project, we had like, we played one set three times throughout the night and we were just a band. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a lot of fun. I think at the time we were calling ourselves like Cross Currents. Okay. But at the time- I was hoping for Red Day or something. I, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, not related to Green Day at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that the school year ends and we're like, hey, that was a lot of fun. What if we kept this going? What if we, you know, kind of started to write our own music and, you know, actually pursue this? And so we did. And, and like kind of like early summer, we were playing some friends graduation parties, still being a unintentional Green Day cover band at this point. Uh, but eventually we started writing our own music. Uh, recording it and putting it out, and then that band eventually became Falling Upstairs, which was the name of my first band. Oh yeah. 
Um, from there, you know, th eventually that kind of, you know, teetered out and there were a couple other bands in between now and now. I mean, I'm happy to get into them, but I don't know what time, <laughs> what time either. code we're at. I, so <laughs> yeah, we're doing great on time. I'm slightly concerned this SD card might fill up because I realized that I normally use bigger SD cards ah. and this one might be close to full because it's a smaller one because my bigger ones are holding files from yesterday that I haven't had. I, under, I understand the, the concern. whole, the whole bullshit here, but that's okay. If it, uh, actually the last episode, I <laughs> didn't format the SD card before it. So it turns out, uh, normally the, SD card can hold like three or four episodes and it was holding four of them. <laughs> wow. So I started the episode with four on there and like, Damn. I think eight minutes in, we look over the TVs off and it was like, oh, how did no. I fuck that up? Oh. We only lost like 30 seconds. It wasn't really a thing, but um, yeah, having uh, paranoid flashbacks to that. So uh, we'll get to it. Um, last little bit here before I let you go. Uh, we've talked a lot about, yeah, drums and uh, directing and film and all like the, the hard skills. What are you doing outside of this? Is there any hobbies you're into? Yeah. Is there something else you're doing for fun? Like I am, I am so bad at having fun. I, I love my work and because I'm self-employed, it's great that I can work 24 hours a day if I really want to. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately at times I do really want to, which has catastrophic effects on the rest of my life. But yeah, it's easy to stay in motion. Uh, and so like drums are here. I've been getting into golf. It's just like, mm -hmm. I need to find other things I like. I need to find other things that like bring me fulfillment. And I also think that like in learning drums, it's like, I'm never gonna be a drummer. I have no interest in starting a band. Like I, it, it would be a disaster to me if I ever got that far. But mm -hmm. like, it's a really good thing to just have something I can do for fun that is just like, just for me. Like, let me yeah. just show up and learn this thing. Let me practice this thing. Let me go be bad at a golf course and be the worst golfer on this course and relish in that. Whereas mm -hmm. like with my camera, it's like everything is like, how can I make this better? What is this? Blah, 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 blah. How do I make this better? And on the golf course, it's like, I'm a fucking miss the ball <laughs> yeah. and it's going to keep happening uh -huh. and it's going to be a great day out here. Like, is there anything outside of yeah music and film that you're interested in? Anything else that you <laughs> consume your brain with or you kind of... Dude, these are two things. Well, it's funny. I will say that anthems is pretty all-consuming, yeah. and I say that in a really good way. Yeah. You know, I sometimes find myself wondering what the hell I thought about before <laughs> I was in this band. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of my spare time is just focused on what's coming up next. Like, yeah. what does that look like? Where can we go? And it's 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 problems that I like to think about. And I wouldn't yeah. even, problems isn't even the right word. But it's it's very interesting to me. So I will say that that takes up a decent amount of mental mm -hmm. time, you know, actual physical time, not as maybe not as much. But um, and I will say filmmaking also does that not quite as much. You know, there was a period after I was done with school, um, probably up to the pandemic, really, because mm -hmm. that kind of took a hit where I was making short films for fun. Yeah. So filmmaking, not for a band or for other people, but just for myself. Yeah. Me and my housemates were making like kind of fun comedy stuff. It's still all on YouTube under uh, Last Turn Films. We don't make it anymore. I'll preface that with I'll this was something that we did do. I did my best to dig through your Facebook <laughs> and try and find the history of Mark. And there wasn't a lot. Well, so I'm very it, excited it, it to did go, kind of come, yeah. come to an unintentional end around the pandemic. There are just so many unknowns. This isn't a new story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so for a while, there was filmmaking for fun on the side. Besides that, yeah, I do play a decent amount of video games. Hell yeah. I'm what's, sure. What's the my game of choice? What's the one right now? Uh, so the one I probably play most frequently is Rocket League. Hell yeah. Uh, yep. Which is a lot of fun. Are you uh, I competitive play... with it? Are you like, uh, I don't mean how good are you, but like, yeah. are you and personally like competitive I, with I it? I can be <laughs> yeah. to an extent because I also know that the the guy that I usually play with most regularly We've accepted that we're not good. <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, we are. Like, according sure. to our rank, we yeah, are. Yeah. But, like, we're not really playing to be like, oh, we have to be the best. And, like, we're not super yeah. competitive. For the most part, it's just for fun. Um, though, of course, you know, that the, the sting yeah. of loss always, <laughs> uh, you know, riles us up a bit. Uh, but then, you know, aside from that, like, you know, I play Sea of Thieves a decent yep. amount, but like I, I kind of bop around. Like when new games and stuff come out, I usually play. Mm -hmm. I, I have a we have a group of friends that play games a lot together, yeah. so that's that's a pretty big. I've been playing hobby. RuneScape for a lot of my adult life, nice. and in the last like six months, I've slowly weaned myself off of like. Let me play drums. Drums feels like a lot better use of my time <laughs> than woodcutting in a fictional game, but I do love me some woodcutting <laughs> in RuneScape. Well, it's funny. Uh, I remember, so I've never played RuneScape. Okay. I'm very familiar with what it is, but I remember back in the day when I was probably like seven or eight, yeah. uh, I used to do gymnastics, and there was a kid on my team 
who kept trying to get me into RuneScape. And I'm sure this was probably when it was at like its its yeah. height way back in the day. Yeah. And I never did, but that has always stuck with me because he was always so persistent. I was always yeah. like, yeah, yeah, like that sounds cool. Like I'll get into it. Never did it's such for a no niche particular game reason. That, yeah, somehow in my desire to be productive, it's like the perfect way of like it, you are, uh, it's all very like passive. So mm -hmm. in like Rocket League, there's probably a lack, or to me, in my perception, there's a lack of progress in Rocket League where your, your progress in Rocket League is measured by how much better you get at the game. But it's mm -hmm. so hard to like, know that you're better now than you were six months ago when you're playing rocket league like i assume you have no sense of of progress in that way like you're always just one step behind whoever you lost to and one step ahead of whoever you beat yeah where in runescape there's a real like linear progression in that sense of like yeah my level's higher than it was and somehow that like is the right variety of numbness for my brain to yeah. get lost in of like oh i am doing something there is a, a big goal that i'm working towards that, that's a good way yeah, to look at it I'd say. works for my my specific makeup i guess well it's fine i always kind of view video games as like because i do have a group of people that i play with fairly regularly mm -hmm. It almost becomes like we're just hanging out chatting yeah. primarily yeah. and the video game is like the secondary yep. thing and, and that'll that'll vary from game to game depending on what we're playing but it, it's just a nice way um, it was great, you know, through the pandemic, but also now that I don't live with them anymore. There we go. We got one minute left on the card. All right. Um, Time to wrap it up. <laughs> kind of. Let me, let me pause and get yeah, the card yeah. and switch out and then we'll finish the episode here. Uh, back at it like nothing ever happened. I guess if you're watching, you might have seen me stand up, but if you're listening, <laughs> nothing happened there. Um, we're talking about video games. We're talking about uh, games that we like. Um, oh, I had one follow-up thought there that I really liked and I really wanted to come to but i don't remember what it was and that's a tragedy but that's what happens down here sometimes um one last little piece i want to touch on we kind of touched on it quickly there uh the competitive nature yeah uh, so i and i'm totally transitioning gears here i guess yeah kind of starting fresh <laughs> the conversation for the moment uh last week or two weeks ago i was talking with ryan obear from chain twist uh, mm -hmm. and one thing i brought up with him is that i used to be hyper competitive and you kind of mentioned gymnastics and sports and for me it was soccer growing up uh that i just like everything was a competition and mm -hmm. i was competitive in soccer but it was also like if we're taking a test i want to do it better than you i want to hand it in first i want to like be more confident like every yep. little thing became competitive to me um and when I was talking to Ryan, I said that, like, I'm not really competitive anymore because I know in art, like, I can't compete against other artists. It's just not quite mm -hmm. valid in that sense. Uh, or I recognize it's unhealthy, if if nothing else. Uh, so I've done a good job of, like, turning it into me and competing against myself. Mm. And that kind of took me on this path of, like, what am I competing against? Like, what 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 is the the enemy there? And I was working, actually, working on the Anthems photos uh, from the other night. Uh, I realized that what I'm working against is what I think other people's expectations are of my art. Mm -hmm. So as I'm making that, there's a part of my brain that goes like, oh, fuck, they're not going to believe how good this is. <laughs> and like, right. to some yeah. degree, like, fuck, who cares? Like, I'm making this for me. Yeah. But it was an interesting, like, oh, that's what I'm competing against. It's what I'm, because it's, it's not against myself. I thought it was against myself. And it's like, no, because I'm always, I'm always impressed with what I do. That's why I do it. That's yeah. why I keep doing it. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. I wouldn't make, I wouldn't get to the final step if I didn't like the first steps. Uh and then as I got there, it was like, oh, I'm competing against what I think that they think I'm going to make, which is such a bullshit mm -hmm. assessment of like, I can't compete against what I think your expectations are. Right. I don't know your expectations. And even if I do, like, if I sent you those photos and I think you guys have liked them, but if you, if I sent them to you and they never saw your socials, like if you guys didn't uh, support them, yeah. I'd kind of be like, well, they didn't get it. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's this weird thing of like, I'm competing against your expectations, but even if I don't meet them, I'm still kind of like, well, that's on them. Mm -hmm. uh, are you competitive at all? Like, as you're doing the filmmaking, as there's the drumming, there must be a sense of like, I got to play this film faster than that guy, or got to make this <laughs> film better. But like, yeah, in art, that's not quite a valid thing. Like, are you competitive? How does the, how does that energy, because there is a, I think anyone who does any, any art wants to get better at it. And in the desire for progress, I think competition is kind of a natural byproduct or mm -hmm. a natural result of that. But again, yeah, in art, it's a lot different than in sports, a lot different than in gymnastics where you have a score and your yes. score is better or worse than someone else's where like the better parts of video, it's like you can like it or dislike it, but it's hard to objectively be like, oh, this is where it ranks in the hierarchy of such mm -hmm. and such. Um, yeah. Are you competitive? Are you able to like turn that off? Are you able to c create just altruistically or is there some like chip on your shoulder that you're competing against as you make art and explore all these ventures? Yeah. Um, well, I will say... When it comes to drums, I'm not competitive at okay. all because that's a competition I lose. Yeah, uh, I am good enough. You'd beat me. You beat <laughs> the hell out of my ass that competition. I, 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 I learned I, Ghost Note the other day, and I was like, "Oh, I'm, this I'm is fucking insane. Travis Barker." Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've always thought that I've been good enough at drums for the things that I pursue. But yeah. you know, I look around anywhere in the local scene. 
I see so many more talented drummers mm -hmm. than I am. And that's fine. You know, that's never been something that's bothered me. That's just kind of how it is. You know, I, I've also just with kind of how my path has taken, you know, I don't really practice just by myself at all. My my drum set lives at Sean and Dante's house. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and when we're recording, I, I have an electric kit that I set up, but that's not set up full time. I d with my current situation, I just don't have room for it. So mm -hmm. drums, not really competitive. Um, you know, it's interesting. I do kind of find myself constantly at odds with myself um, and kind of competing against my expectations and my my own standards for myself um you know i've always kind of held myself to a high standard and that's <laughs> not even i was gonna say weird flex but it's not even really a flex it's actually if anything it's been quite uh troubling to deal with because me, it's been a huge source of anxiety yeah like i'm always trying to one-up that thing which makes me both have to look in the past and be like oh i'm better than that now which means that's bad now mm -hmm. like what am i competing against yeah it's ultimately stressful yeah so so i am definitely kind of competitive against myself and that i feel like i kind of have to keep outdoing myself or, or not even outdoing myself but just reach i have to perform at a certain level yeah. and if i don't reach that level whatever project is a failure. So, so that's kind of why I always, and it's not really just filmmaking, you know, it's, it's being in a band too. Whenever I'm involved in a project, I have to commit mm -hmm. my all. And, you know, being in, um, very, um, oh boy, what's the word? It, cooperative or, uh, what's the word? Collaborative? Collaborative. Thank you. I knew it was a C word. So being in, in very collaborative, activities like both filmmaking and being in a band, you know, I have to constantly separate and make sure that I'm not holding other people to the standard that I hold myself because yep. it's unrealistic. Yep. And that's not really a great thing. I know yep. that's that's something that I need to and continue will continue to work on. Um, but sometimes it can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I do kind of find myself constantly at odds with myself and trying to 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 reach a certain goal, but also make sure that I'm not because I I am a perfectionist. I'm all the yeah. things. I'm the perfectionist. I'm you know obsessing over these things, yeah. and I it's a shame because at the end of the day I recognize that it leads to good stuff that I can be proud of, yeah. but it's not really sustainable. Yep. And you know there have been times, very few occasions where like other people have asked me to do stuff, and you know that's not even necessarily something that I'm trying to pursue, but it, when that happens, I'm torn because I love to do this kind of stuff. It's a lot of fun, it's obviously my passion, um, but I then assume other people are gonna hold me to the same standard that I hold myself, mm -hmm. and that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, because it's one thing if I do it to myself, but if I think other people are gonna do, do that to me, it almost seems unattainable. That's interesting. I I almost have the opposite thing there where to me client work is tremendously freeing because it's like I know what I hold myself to and they'll never hold myself <laughs> to that standard. So I think if I can make me happy then I'll exceed their expectations mm. and that's ultimately what Oh, it's right? very <laughs> irrational on my part for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, and I think the other part there the flip side is like yeah, it is an anxiety inducer. Like it's a stress inducer thing of like yeah, I'm just obsessive over everything I do. And mm -hmm. that to me is where something like drums has been great of like, oh, I'm terrible at this. And that's very important. That's <laughs> yeah. really important to me because everything else, it's like, yeah, when I'm making a video for anyone, it's like, I want to knock your socks off. And also like, I'm not lost that when you've hired me for this, like there is some amount of hours you worked that made this happen and probably mm -hmm. not at a job you love. Mm -hmm. Like there's some sacrifice you had to make to bring me on board. And if I don't deliver, uh, yeah, I have to repay you for that. And like, I know that financially I'm being paid and like to, for my services at the counter, but like that doesn't feel like enough to me. It's mm -hmm. like, I, I want to make sure that you are so happy with this thing that those hours feel like they were well spent. Like mm -hmm. if I send you the product and you go, I worked how many hours for this? It's like, no, 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 that can never be yeah. the thing. Like it yep. always has to be an exceeding of expectations, which yeah, to some degree is like, I know that no one's holding me to standards. I'm holding me to, but like, fuck, that means I'm always kind of falling short of expectations because, yeah, nothing is ever perfect. Nothing's yeah. ever done. Mm -hmm. And everything I send out always has something in it where it's like, fuck, if I could justify 100 more hours, then yeah. I, would, I would fix this thing. But I just cannot. I will lose. I won't be able to pay rent if I spent 100 more hours yep. working on this thing. Like, this mm -hmm. is a 10-hour project. If it becomes a 100-hour project, like, my life is fucked up. Like, <laughs> I, I literally cannot do that. But, yeah, that's in every single project. In every video I've sent mm. out, I can always point out something of, like, 
ah, I wish I wish I had an answer for this question, and uh-huh. I don't. And sometimes we don't have the answers. That's part of it. Um, but yeah, somehow working with clients then has been really freeing of like, okay, that confines what I'm doing. Whereas when I'm working for myself, there's like this endless like, oh, what if? There's an escalation of sorts. Mm-hmm. Whereas with a client, it's like, okay, they've defined the parameters, and now I can like find peace in that, and now I have a deadline. So I can't go forever i cannot tweak this thing forever because it's due friday yeah and i don't care if it's done yeah they don't care when it's done they need it by friday they don't care if it's gonna be done in six months like Mm -hmm. that doesn't help anyone like it needs to be done and so in there to me it's like okay let me get as good as i can by friday Mm -hmm. and now that gives me freedom to create where instead of it getting to friday and being like (gasps) whoa what if we took a left turn here (laughs) Uh uh so i don't know i think the the client thing has been a a really positive experience for me but i think for a lot of people it's kind of similar to you where it's a yeah, a terrifying thing. And for me, it's been almost freeing to work that sense huh. instead of working for me. Well, so that's interesting. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for what you've done and, and what you've built for yourself. Because for me, the idea of, of working for other people, while it's really fun and the times that I have done it, it's turned out really well. Yeah. You know, I mentioned with Better Parts, that was a two, three month process where yeah. I was obsessing over that. Yep. That's definitely not sustainable. And on yep. top of that, you know, I I know that I'll like what I make because I'm making it. <laughs> yep. I don't know what the other person wants or if they'll know. And, and I'm sure to some respect, like when someone goes to you, they're hiring you. They're familiar with your work. They're familiar with your quality. Sometimes. There's a reason they're hiring shocked you. Sometimes. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, so, and, and I could be totally off base because this isn't what I do. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. not necessarily, yeah. if I did pursue that, I would have to do a lot of soul searching and yeah. a lot of work. But to me, it's it's I. What would terrify me is I'm trying to figure out what you want and yeah. make what you want and what you would like, and that may not always align with yeah. what I do. And and you know, for my job, my nine to five, I'm lucky enough that I I do this. Like mm-hmm. I do video production and editing, and it's way more corporate, of course, yep. not not as fun as yeah. as what you do. Um, but sometimes in that environment you can create something that you really like and it doesn't hit. And, oh, yes. and that's it. All right, back to the drawing board. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Yep. So, and, and that probably influences my, you know, uh, hesitation around the idea of working for other people because it's like, man, I don't know if I could take someone not liking yeah. what I do, especially after I put way too much time into yep. it <laughs> uh, the i do some corporate work and so the, yeah half of my job is music videos and the other half is i work with a production company that does like fall and spring shows for colleges generally okay. speaking mm-hmm. uh, so you mentioned fairfield we do clam jam we do press ball at oh, fairfield. oh yeah yep so i resonate with you that sometimes the corporate stuff can be a little complicated where it's like yeah my the people around me are great and the the people commissioning my work is great uh, but sometimes yeah on the school end of stuff it's like yeah sometimes they'll ask for stuff and it's like I get it. I get why this is valuable to you, but I'm a, in the context of making a film. This is this is almost irrelevant feedback to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I feel you. That yeah, there is a, a line there, and I don't know. I think to me, it's still a uh, part of paying the bills. Yeah, <laughs> of I doing I the hear corporate that. stuff. Of like, <laughs> uh-huh. some degree. Yeah, to some degree. Uh, har- my joke is always that Harvard's budget is better than most bands. <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> very it's true. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's an easier way to make a living than <laughs> trying to make it off of bands. Um, hell yeah, I mean, mission accomplished. That feels like a good, good place stuff. to wrap up. We're 13 minutes into the episode. Let's go. <laughs> um, hell yeah, an hour and a half. We might be, this might be my longest or close to my longest. Oh, um, damn. I've slowly been trying to stretch out episodes. So it used to be, yeah, 45 minutes and I made it to an hour. And now we're trying to do an hour, hour 15. And we made it to an hour and a half. I mean, it's um, funny. Uh, approaching this, I was like, man, I feel like given what you do, <laughs> I was like, we could go for like three hours yep. if, if we're not careful. So I'm glad that you were able to kind of rein me in a little bit, which is good. I appreciate so. No, appreciate you coming through. Yeah, I uh, I don't think I have quite enough life to talk about to make three hours <laughs> interesting. So I'm trying to keep it brief of like, I think I could do an hour of interesting yeah, stuff. Yeah. By three hours, I'm going to be talking about stuff that no one gives a fly <laughs> fuck about. So uh, Mission Accomplished, hour and a half. Uh, Better Parts is out now. Yep. Anthem has a show February 3rd in Milford. Uh, Mark, where do people find you on social media? Is there anything else you want to make people aware of? Uh, what are, yeah, where do people tell you that you did awesome today and that they want to hear more from you? Um, so my personal Instagram handle is at Mark Patrick Prescott. Um, I don't post too often, so don't have high expectations. That's really the only one I use. I would say uh, check out all of Anthem's uh, handles at Anthem's Band for most of it. I would say, you know, we've been talking a lot about video today. Um, you know, Instagram is our main one at Anthem's Band, but I will. we've been trying to ramp up our TikTok a lot, oh, yeah. which... It's a, not necessarily a sentence I'd ever thought I'd say, but it's important for what we do. And yep. we do have very um, 
uh, we we have filmed content just for TikTok, and some of it has trickled onto Instagram Reels. But I would say if you want to see more of us, uh, check us out in those two places because that's where you'll see us the most. Hell yeah, yeah. Every day I'm I don't use TikTok that much, and every day I don't, I regret it. <laughs> like it, it feels like the it's hot new. hand right it's now. New to it's new us. Yeah, yeah. we're we, leading be, into better parts is the first time that we've been able to have like an actual like, hey, we're gonna start uploading these types of videos on this schedule. Yep. We're gonna try and. See where that goes. So. Hell yeah. Yeah. So just to come together. Um, yeah. Episode 54. Uh, what else do I have to plug here? Yeah. Book a music video. Leave a comment. Uh, shout out. Uh, shout out Blind Euphoria. I'm wearing a Blind Euphoria shirt that they gave to me the other day. They rock. They just dropped a new line of clothes the other day. Um, so yeah. Go get go get Blind Euphoria shirts. They're cool guys. Cool homies. Check out Chain Twist. Mostly listen to anthems. Uh, book a music video. And tell Mark he did rad. Dude. Episode 4. Episode 4. Episode 54. <laughs> Something for everyone in the books. Mission accomplished, my man. Hell yeah. Good stuff.